the message this morning that I had prepared for last Sunday. We are doing a series on the four components of Foursquare. Uh, if you look at the image behind me, we have uh, the square of the cross, the square of the dove, the chalice, and the crown. And each one of those represents a different characteristic or component of the Foursquare Gospel, and I shared a little bit about that last week. Um, so just again, to kind of circle back the intro there, Foursquare, the name, uh, the denomination in which Real Life Fellowship is a part of, um, the meaning behind it is that it represents what is equally balanced on all sides, and it's established and enduring. Uh, such confidence in the power of the Gospel is also expressed by the verses uh, the verse found, Hebrews 13.8, which is displayed in the four square churches, proclaiming Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And again, that is within all the different four square churches, a key scripture verse for us. We are Christ-centric. We believe in the Trinity, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But we are not apologetic about saying that it is Jesus who we serve. Jesus is our Lord and Savior. And so last, not last Sunday, but the previous Sunday, uh, I covered that first square, which was Jesus as our Savior. And there again, if you uh, are interested in finding more information about that particular particular doctrinal uh, stance, please look at our website. Go to um, that message, and it'll, it'll be a blessing to you, I do believe. Um, but we are continuing on with the second square, which is Jesus' baptizer with the Holy Spirit. And uh, so we're going to get into that uh, today in unpacking the ministry of Jesus as baptizer with the Holy Spirit. If you want to, go ahead and turn first into Matthew uh, chapter 3. And this is a passage of Scripture that many are familiar with. And this is actually John the Baptist encounter with Jesus, and basically John the Baptist preparing the way for Jesus and then actually baptizing Jesus. And so I'm going to read this account, and uh, we'll see how this ties into that uh, terminology of Jesus as baptizer with the Holy Spirit. Okay? So we're looking at Matthew chapter 3. It says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the, kingdom of, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locust and wild honey. I always found that pretty interesting as a kid to think about what uh, John the Baptist's diet was there. People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of Jordan. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers! Who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. This is where I want us to focus our attention here says, I baptize you, this is John the Baptist, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Wow, John the Baptist, he was, he was sure he was going before the Lord and fulfilling that prophet uh, Isaiah and what was said. 
And then it says in verse 13, it says, Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come to me? In other words, John the Baptist was saying, you've got this confused, Jesus. <laughs> you got your, 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 it should be, roles should be switched here. I'm not the one worthy of baptizing you, and yet you're asking me to baptize you? To which Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went out of the water, and at that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Amen. So, so just again to point out the symbolism, if you will, of the dove related to Jesus as the baptizer with the Holy Spirit. The scriptural context for that symbolism is what we just read through. And I, I find it really amazing within this portion of scripture, there's an emphasis that John the Baptist is, is baptizing Jesus, of course, but then it's Jesus that says that this has to occur to fulfill all righteousness. Such an essential, pivotal point that had to be done right then and there. And I love the confirmation from the Father. In that moment, you, I, I don't like to do the what ifs, but, but the what if of, what if God the Father hadn't said anything? What if that story didn't show and have that moment of God the Father's voice entering into the picture? It wouldn't have been complete. Yet, we see that in this moment on earth, we have the Trinity represented. We have Jesus, the Son of God. We have the Holy Spirit coming down in the form of a dove. And then we have the voice of the Father proclaiming and saying, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. You wonder if there's confirmation in Scripture of the Trinity. That's, that's one of many, but that is definitely one of the key Scriptures that shows the beauty of the Trinity and the relationship between the three of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So, even in an application for us, if you will, of Jesus setting the example of obedience. You know, um, Jesus was fully God and fully man. He came to fulfill the law. He came to make a way to bridge the gap between man's failures and God's holiness, and being able to create a sense of righteousness that we then could come back into proper relationship with our Heavenly Father. And so in this moment, Jesus sets an example of obedience where he recognizes that he needs to show even us the value of baptism in obeying the Father and fulfilling righteousness in that moment. I'm so thankful that Jesus sets an example for us. It wasn't just simply do this and do this and do this. No, it was do this and let me show you by doing it with you the way. Jesus wasn't just the source. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen? So, if you want to... Go ahead and let's forward to uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 14. I've got a lot of scripture I'm going to be reading, particularly this morning, and, and uh, just covering the base here. But this is um, 
Gospel of John chapter 14, and this is Jesus anticipating what's to come towards the end of his life here on earth, and he's actually comforting his disciples and talking to them about the promise of the Holy Spirit. And so I want you to look at John chapter 14, starting in verse 15, and we're going to read down through verse 21. And this is Jesus speaking, and he simply says this, If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him. For he lives with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me anymore, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and show myself to them. Okay, so Jesus again talking to his disciples, and then even for us, all these thousands of years later, for him to speak to us that he is going and he is sending an advocate on his behalf. That advocate is the spirit of truth, the Holy Spirit. And he says the world cannot accept him. In other words, the world isn't so quick just to embrace this message of the Holy Spirit. Their eyes have to be open. There is a drawing of the Holy Spirit of people unto himself and unto God. But there is still a transformation. There is still something that has to happen supernaturally to fully embrace the workings of the Holy Spirit. It should not come as a shock to us, even as the church, as the bride of Christ, to look around our world and go, why is it in the dire straits that it is? Why are people so struggling and so lost in sin? Well, they have not had, even as Paul had the scales fall from his eyes, they have not had that encounter moment with the Holy Spirit and with Jesus and accepting Him as Lord of their life. But Jesus promises the Holy Spirit to the disciples. In other words, He's not saying, I'm going to leave you abandoned as orphans. I'm sending you an advocate. Another scripture says, I must go so that I can send you the Holy Spirit. Amen? So, Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. Another indicator of Jesus as baptizer with the Holy Spirit, that connection point. Again, another portion of Scripture that indicates and shows the value of the Trinity, of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So then we see a fulfillment, and we've shared this before, but if you go ahead and keep turning to Acts chapter 2, verse 4, and I shared this uh, many months back whenever I was covering the book of Acts in greater detail about the role of the Holy Spirit. And as a Spirit-filled church, we do hold to the truths that are found in God's Word of the Holy Spirit being active in today's church. And so we look at uh, Acts chapter 2 as our reference there, and we see in verse 1 it says, When the day of Pentecost came, of course this is following the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. It says, When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like a blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Remember what John the Baptist said that there would be one that would come after him. John the Baptist said, I will baptize you with water, but there will come one after me who will baptize you with what? With fire. Here we go. 
It says, they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now, one of the things I pointed out last time whenever I was sharing in the book of Acts, it wasn't just for God's people to get goosebumpies and spiritual gifts and all that goodness for ourselves. The gift of the Holy Spirit is given to the bride of Christ, to the body of Christ, so that we can go out and give testimony of who Jesus is. If we're failing to do that other part, we're shortchanging the value of why God gave us the Holy Spirit. Does that make sense? So he gave us the Holy Spirit so that we will be empowered to go out and to give testimony of what Jesus did on the cross for our sins. Case in point, turn to Acts chapter 10. If you look at Acts chapter 10, we will see in that time frame, Peter stepping out and doing exactly that. So we see in Acts chapter 10, Cornelius calls for Peter, and he calls him to his house. I will start here. It says in chapter 10, verse 1, just to give a little bit of context, at Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly, One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? He asked. The angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter, He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. I'm going to pause there and move forward. So Cornelius obeys what God is speaking to his heart through the angel, and he calls for Peter to come. So we're going to fast forward to verse 23. And it says the next day, um, I'm sorry, Peter ends up coming to Cornelius' house It says, the next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. That's a whole other story, by the way. If you want to go in, look at Peter's vision, another indicator of where God is moving through the gifts in an amazing, out-of-our-normal sense of thinking way, okay? Go back and read that, but for time's sake, let's move forward. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the believers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up, stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. I love, we know Peter (laughs) and his personality. He had been so impacted by the Holy Spirit, there had even been a shift and a change in a lot of his approach. He was not a puffed up man. He was bold and he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. But I love that he had a very clear recognition of where he stood in relationship to who God was versus who he was as a man. He was simply a vessel being used by God in this moment. He said, stand up. I am only a man myself. While talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. And he said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with or even visit a Gentile. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent me? And so Cornelius goes on, and uh, I'll just read it. I'll take the time. Verse 30, it says, Cornelius answered, Three days ago I was in my house praying at this hour. At three in the afternoon, suddenly a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. 
Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. So they are just poised, ready to hear the testimony that what has Peter got to share with us? This is what Peter says. Then Peter began to speak. Do you think Peter had a sermon prepared? Do you think he had spent a lot of time in route? I mean, he might have been praying, don't get me wrong, going, God, I'm trusting you. But he started to speak under the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. He says, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, announcing the good news of peace through who? Jesus Christ, who was Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout the province of Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached. See the connection? Now God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit. And power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a cross, but God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Now, so we see this, right? Peter gets up there. He starts giving testimony of who Jesus is. And he even goes back to what Jesus experienced with John the Baptist and the fact that Jesus was baptized with fire and with power and that he then promised the gifting of the Holy Spirit. And these are things that Peter and others that were present witnessed to give a full account, testimony. Now, this is amazing says here, verse 44, and I'm almost done. We'll come here to the conclusion in a moment. It says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on Gentiles. Raise your hand if you're a Gentile, right? Aren't you glad that God includes us? Praise the Lord. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized with water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few more days. Again, You see the connection. It goes full circle with Jesus as baptizer with the Holy Spirit. So amazing. So here's the takeaway for us this morning. What value does the Holy Spirit have in your life and in my life? Or another way of putting it, what role does the Holy Spirit play in my life? It's a good question as believers to ask. He is a completing factor in the heart and in the life of the believer. The Holy Spirit is the confirmation of God the Father's acceptance of His Son through baptism. We saw that in Scripture where God the Father says, This is my Son in whom I am well pleased. The Holy Spirit is the fulfillment of, of a promise from our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will send forth an advocate. And we see in Acts chapter 2, that promise was fulfilled. The Holy Spirit is a gift 
for the empowerment of the believer to do what? To give testimony of Jesus as our Savior. It goes full circle back to Jesus as our Savior and as our baptizer with the Holy Spirit. Concluding final scripture, if you want to turn to Ephesians chapter 1. And this will wrap it up for us this morning and then we'll pray. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. This is of course Paul writing to the church in Ephesus. Simply says this. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reached their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in the heaven, in heaven and on earth under Christ in him. We were also chosen, having been, be, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we who were the first to put our hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And you also, this is, getting, this is gonna get good here in a second, y'all. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. The Holy Spirit is a seal. A, de- a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. How many of you want to receive an inheritance? Right? How much more so would you like to get a ticket of guarantee that that inheritance is guaranteed yours? Nobody can take it away. The Holy Spirit is that deposited seal on the heart of the believer that it is guaranteed that inheritance in your life to the glory and to the praise of God's glory. Amen. That is such an encouragement to us as a believer, the spiritual blessing that we find in Christ Jesus through the Holy Spirit as a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance. I hope that encourages you this morning as much as it does me, embracing the value of the Holy Spirit in our lives and having the scriptural truth backed position of his role in the heart of the believer. Amen. Why don't we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you that you put it in clear verbiage, language. Lord, we are thankful for this Bible. We are thankful for your word. Holy Spirit, that it was inspired by you. It is inerrant. It is living. It is a part of our life, and it is such a blessing. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for for opening up our eyes of understanding to be able to read this bread of life and to partake and to apply it to our hearts. I pray that each of us would in fact do what was prescribed in God's word, embracing the Holy Spirit, being baptized, going forth out into this world and giving testimony of who Jesus is as our Savior. 
Lord, we give you thanks again for all of your blessings, for your provision, for your fulfilled promises. We ask that you continue to move in our hearts and in the hearts of the believers. We pray that you continue to move in our community, continue to move in our church. We give you thanks. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, blessings to y'all. Uh, we will be transitioning here momentarily. Uh, for those of you that want to uh, stay for the business meeting, we'll do that. Um, but uh, aside from that, God bless y'all. We'll see y'all next week.